a physician, as was mentioned, and I am an OBGYN. And I practice in New Hampshire. I've been at a residency for almost five years now, actually, which is crazy to believe. So I, um, if you want to know that my whole story about schooling, I went to college in Buffalo, New York, and that was a rough <laughs> few years of my life. I was not a huge fan of Buffalo. Um, and then I went to medical school in Kirksville, Missouri. I went to an osteopathic medical school called Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, which is um, actually the founding school of osteopathic medicine. And I loved that experience. It was very interesting. Um, and then I did my residency in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that was in an allopathic um, residency program. And in fact, I only applied to allopathic residency programs. And um, there's still, I think, people who wonder about the DO and MD difference. So I can definitely chat more about that at some point if you're interested. But I did um, an allopathic or an MD residency. And I am board certified through um, ACOG, which is the um, allopathic portion of there's um, there it's all kind of coming together now but essentially I'm a DO but I did my residency at an MD at an MD program and I have my board certification through an MD um, um, national certification MBOME so that's a little about about me so it really can cross paths here so um, after residency I came back to my home state of New Hampshire where I am in private practice and that's something that, again, is not around very much anymore, especially in OBGYN. Because of the nature of OBGYN is um, historically a lot of call and um, I'm in a very good situation. My um, work-life balance is incredible. Um, I love what I do. I'm a general OBGYN, which means that I do about 50-50. I do 50%, meaning 50% OB and 50% GYN. And the GYN portion is a lot of like annual exams, pap smears, routine office stuff, um, kind of like primary care, which I really like, and then um, surgery as well. So I do surgery several times a month. Um, and the types of surgery I do besides C-sections are things like um, hysteroscopies, tubal ligations, um, hysterectomies, ovarian cyst removals, lots, lots of fun um, GYN surgeries. And I love all of it. Um, and let's see, my, my um, family, I have three kids. And I had my first daughter when I was a resident, which is possible for sure. Never delay childbearing for um, your career. That's my recommendation for you. And then I had my second two children as an attending physician. Um, I do have um, a side business outside of my clinical practice as a life coach. And I got into that. I coach women physicians um, um, restrictly right now. And I... Um, do a lot of speaking to uh, medical students and early career physicians about imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is thinking you're not smart enough or good enough, or you don't really belong in medical school, um, which I had. And I almost quit my job because of imposter syndrome. So now I go back and I talk to students and residents about imposter syndrome and how to overcome it. So that's just a little side um, project that I have that I really enjoy. So I will tell you all of the things that you want to know about me or OBGYN or anything that I can help you with um, to help you kind of, if you're on the fence about being an OBGYN. One thing I do want to mention, because um, it comes up every single time I talk to medical students and residents, is that I think there's still some rumors out there in the world that you cannot go into OBGYN if you want to have a family or ever sleep again or... <laughs> <laughs> All of those things. And what I want to tell you is that you absolutely can go to any career, OBGYN or not, and do something else. And in fact, if you have an awareness of what you want out of life and not just become a doctor someday, which if you want to be a doctor, you will, you can become a doctor, you can definitely do that. But there's a career for you that fits into your life. You don't have to 
change yourself or change your values in order to fit into a career that you want. And that's true for OBGYN. For example, my call, I'm on call one in about once a week or one in nine, which is incredible. I have one day off a week. I have several weekends off that I have both Saturday and Sunday off. I get off of work at 4 p.m. Um, so, and that's just one option. And there are people who just work three nights a week and do that for their life. So whatever is going to work for you and for your life, you can absolutely make possible an OBGYN. So don't let anyone tell you that it's not possible. Okay, that's, I'll get off my pedestal now. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for yeah. that introduction. Um, we've had a lot of questions come in already. So one of the questions um, that a lot of people had at the beginning was, if you could talk a little more about MDDO and like your thoughts on it, I guess some major differences. Um, and then like if you struggle to find a residency and an allop allopathic school as a DO. Yeah. So this is so interesting because I remember being um, in college and deciding to go to medical school and being really hyper-focused on this decision. Do I do MD? Do I do DO? And I remember not even knowing what DO was until I like happened across it one day at like a career fest or something. And I was like, what the heck is this? So luckily I, I figured it out and I did apply to both MD and DO schools. I think I ended up applying to more DO schools and ultimately got into my first choice, which was um, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine. So the difference um, really is just in the manipulation, the osteopathic manipulative treatment. So osteopathic physicians do additional several hours a week for the first two years of medical school, learning about osteopathic manipulative treatment. I think that historically there are some places that will say like, oh, osteopathic schools look at the patient as a whole and there's more holistic approach. I think that's maybe true, but I think that more allopathic schools are doing the same thing now just because people recognize the importance of the holistic view. Um, it's so, why this is so funny is because I remember being so torn about this and really feeling like, oh, people aren't going to think I'm as good as MDs because I'm going to a DO school. I was really obsessed about it actually as a student. I was freaked out. I wouldn't get into a residency. I was freaked out that I wouldn't get a job. And I'll tell you something, I don't, I haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about it in 10 years. So what I'll, what I'll tell you is that go to a school that you like, go to a school that you can get into and you're going to be a physician. And I'll tell you that after the initial training and once you're out there in the world, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, my partners, I have two MD partners and then, and there's myself and my other partner is a DO. There's no difference to how we practice medicine. We respect each other. No one even brings it up professionally now. It's a non-issue. So as far as the, having trouble getting into residency, I did not. I, like I said, I had tons of interviews. Most of them were at allopathic programs. And um, only one of them brought up the fact that I was a DO. And it was a horribly awful program. Like not awful training-wise, but really malignant. Um, so I hope that's different now. But every other program I interviewed at didn't bring it up once. They didn't mention it. They didn't ask why I was a DO or MD. It didn't matter to them. Um, and then at, in residency at an allopathic program, there were, um, three DOs and two MDs in my class. So it was actually half and half at my program. So it was a non-issue in residency. And when I went to applying for my job, no one cared. <laughs> well, no one cared what kind of degree I had. So when right now, when you're in, when you're a pre-med and you're trying to figure it out, it feels like a huge decision, but it's not. Either way, you're a physician. Either way, you're a great physician. It's all about what you put into it. Great. Thank you so much for that. And yeah. Those really positive words. That's really good to hear. Um, there were several people who asked um, about like the OB and GYM part, if you can practice one exclusively, um, if you have to practice both, and what you do exactly. Yeah, you can do anything. You can do literally anything, which is so nice about OBGYN. So I do, ev I do it all. I do... Um, so when we think about the field of OBGYN, there's general OBGYN, which is basic prenatal care, delivering babies, doing C-sections, that kind of thing. Then there's gynecology, which is office procedures, placing IUDs, birth control, pap smears, that kind of stuff. And then there's GYN surgery. And then there are options to do fellowships within OBGYN, which I am not, I didn't do any fellowships, but there's gyne which is 
um, gynecologic cancers like uterine ovarian cancer, cervical cancer. Those gynecologs don't do any OB. They only do GYN cancer surgeries and difficult GYN surgeries. Then there's REI, reproductive endocrinology and infertility. That's a fellowship that does like IVF, fertil infertility issues, um, that kind of thing, recurrent, mis recurrent pregnancy loss. And then there's maternal fetal medicine, our MFM, and that's OB only. So only seeing high-risk pregnancies, doing a lot of ultrasounds, sometimes placing cerclages. Um, some MFMs don't do any deliveries and they only see patients in, in an outpatient setting. Some MFMs, if you're at an academic center, do also deliveries. So there are lots of options to kind of create the career that you want um, within OBGYN. One of the reasons I like OBGYN is because of the, the diversity of it. I can do like just this week alone, yesterday I was in the office in the morning, then I had surgery in the afternoon. Today I was in the office all day. Tomorrow I'm on OB call. So I'm at the, I'm on labor and delivery all day. Thursday I'm off, Friday I'm back in the office. So it's not like the same thing every day. It's something different, which I really enjoy. Oh, and you can do like, even if you're not, uh, even if you don't get fellowship trained, you can still just do OB only. Like you can be only a laborist which means you only work on the birth center delivering babies. That's an option. Or you can be GYN only and you can just do office GYN and or surgery. And then there's one more fellowship within GYN that I forgot, which is urogynecology, which is basically like bladder stuff, like urology and gynecology together. Great. Thank you so much. A lot of people were asking like very specifically the things that you were hitting on. So we appreciate that. Um, it's really awesome to hear that there's so many options um, going into ob dine. So that's all great. Um, we also had questions just asking about residency um, and, you know, how competitive it is to get into OBGYN residency and was it quite heavy based on step scores? And if so, how do you think that's going to change now that step one is pass fail? Yeah. Um, I think historically OBGYN is one of the like middle of the road when it comes to competitiveness. Um, I think it depends on the year, to be honest. I think it's one of those that's very, it's, it's a, either a kind of competitive or middle of the road competitive. Um, that being said, it's not something I think that people can't get into. It's not something like super competitive that you won't get an admit, you, you won't get somewhere. I think if you want to be an OBGYN and you apply broadly to residency programs, then you'll get in to somewhere. Um, when it comes to step scores, I think that that's becoming less and less of a concern. Um, my test scores were mediocre at best, to be honest, and that was not something that people touched on. And now, I think the residency program matters. I wasn't applying to, you know, Ivy League programs. That's not, because those are the people who want the best scores. That's not my jam. I really care more about um, someone who's going to train me to have good bedside manner and talk to people. And I didn't want to do like a lot of research or anything like that. I just wanted to do like bread and butter, being a doctor, talking to people, you know, not, nothing crazy. Um, so people cared more about my work ethic my ability to work as a team, like as a team player, and my ability to talk as a human being. Like, can I talk to someone? Can I have a conversation with you without being awkward? Um, can I, do I get along with you? Uh, am I like, do I cause a lot of drama? It's more like how, you know, and again, how hard am I going to work? Am I going to, you know, have a growth mindset? Those things um, tend to matter more for the majority of programs than a step score. Great. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, and it's always on our minds. Yeah, um, definitely. It's part of the whole thing. So thank you for that. Um, kind of still going off of the whole schooling stuff. Um, a lot of people are wondering if there's anything that you feel either um, when applying to medical school or residencies that made you stand out as an applicant. Um, I think that my um, reviews on how I did during my um, rotations as a medical student helped a lot, like um, my showing my work ethic, showing that I'm a team player. I think that they really took those into consideration, um, that I 
tried my best and I was always very pleasant. I cared about the patient first. There's, I wasn't ever like too good for anything. Like, um, you can always learn from nurses. That was my, that's my big thing. It's this kind of like humble confidence, which is kind of my go-to, <laughs> my go-to confidence, which I think has really helped me. So I think if anything, that's, that was the most helpful for me when it came to getting into a program. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so there are other questions, um, kind of also relating to the DO aspect asking um, how do you use your DO training, if at all, in your current practice? And are there uh, many advantages to that training that you received? Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't. And for a, for a long time after residency, like we would, I would like crack backs and stuff for my friends and family. Um, but because I went to an allopathic program, it wasn't, in, it, we didn't continue on with our osteopathic training. Um, I don't know that I miss, I don't know that I, miss it. I think manipulation is incredible. I think that um, for people who like it, who like manipulation and want to use it in their practice, that's they should go to an osteopathic residency program where they continue to hone in on the skills of manipulation. Um, I have patients often ask me um, if I do manipulation or if I know a DO who does do manipulation. And in fact, I have a lot of patients who come and see me because I'm a DO. They specifically are looking for a DO and come to see me for that reason. Um, because I think the perception is um, that I look at more uh, like of the person as a whole than just throwing pills at someone. And I think that, I mean, you're going to find an MD who's going to do the same thing, but I think that's the perception that people are getting about DOs now, which I think is nice. Um, I'm so glad I went to an osteopathic school because I think it primed me to look at the importance of looking at a patient as a, as a person and not just as a symptom. And also about all the other like alternative therapies that could be really useful for treating syndromes instead of just medication. That's great. Thank you for answering that question for us. Um, there was another interesting question and we've gotten this before. So you want to hear your take on it on um, OBGYN malpractice and malpractice insurance. There is, um, we've heard that it's tends to be more expensive for OBs. Is that true? And can you kind of talk about that, the malpractice aspect? Yeah, it's super expensive. It's it's super expensive, but um, you don't buy it for yourself. So for example, I am in private practice, so I care about it more than most OBGYNs do um, because I've my, me and my partners physically have to pay for it. It's super expensive because the reason why is that when you deliver babies, people can sue you for like 18 to 20 years later, which is a long time. Like normally if you're like a surgeon or something, they can sue you for like a year. So that's why it's so expensive because people have a long time to decide if something was your fault. Um, but that being said, it's not like it's, a, it's, a, if, if you're in private practice, you, you might care about it, but if you're a hospital employee, like most OBGYNs are, then the hospital pays for it. You don't. Great, thank you for bringing, or sharing that with us because we had heard very early on when we started um, the program that it was um, orthopedic surgeons and OBGYNs that had really high uh, malpractice insurance. So that's interesting to learn about because we didn't know. So thank you yeah, for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, a lot of people were just asking about um, what it's like being in private practice um, and, you know, you kind of mentioned your schedule being um, nine to one, I think you said, um, but do they just want to know like what's on call like, um, if you guys get worked it out together for your schedules and stuff like that? Yeah, so my um, practice is my practice partner, my partners and I, there's four physicians and we own the practice. And then we have five midwives and two, like one PA and one nurse practitioner. So, um, we make our own hours. We do everything. So my, our office hours are 7.30 to 4. And that's what I work. I don't think I said 9 to 1. Maybe I did. But my typically my typical hours are 7.30 to 4. That's like the office hours. And we made those hours. In fact, that, that's actually new. Last year, we wanted to close early because we wanted to have more time at night in the summer. So we closed at 4 instead of 5. 
And then we were we were like, we don't ever want to work until five anymore. So we just changed our office hours, which is really nice to have the freedom to do that. You wouldn't have that in an employed practice. Um, my, my schedule when I'm on call is a little bit different than most OBs because I am on call covering two midwives who are certified nurse midwives, which means they went to extra school for doing hospital deliveries and they do all of the normal vaginal deliveries. They take care of all of the patients and I'm just there as the backup. So tomorrow when I'm on call, I have a C-section in the morning and then I'm just basically covering the, and seeing if I'm there, if the midwives need me for anything, if I need to do a vacuum or if I need to prepare a bad, a bad perineal um, tear or something like that, or seeing patients in the, in the ER for GYN consults, like an ectopic pregnancy or something like that. Um, but otherwise I'm just kind of hanging out, being there as a, as a um, um, resource for the midwives. And, and in surgery, it's kind of like, I'm doing everything on my own. Um, like the other day when I had surgeries, I had a tubal, I had um, a repair of like a labial um, fusion, just kind of strange, but, and then I had a hysteroscopy and sometimes I'll have hysterectomy, whatever, um, variety of different things. So, and that kind of just depends on what my, what patients I see in the office and what they need done as far as surgery goes. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that really kind of helps people get more of an idea of what's going on. Um, kind of still going off the private practice uh, questions. Um, a lot of people are wondering if it's important to have like business skills or an MBA um, to be a partner in a private practice because we've kind of heard both sides. So if you could put in your two cents on that. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be helpful, but I don't have any of that. I learned it all on the fly. I, when I was um, in residency, I had no idea that the private practices still existed because in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was, it was all hospital owned. Um, but when I was looking for a job back home in my home state of New Hampshire, there happened to be a private practice um, hiring. And the benefit of that was over my schedule. I got get way more vacation and CME than I do as a, as a hospital employed um, person. Um, and I just have a lot more control. Like if I have to leave because my husband, my kid is sick or I have to get my, my, one of my kids from daycare, I just leave. I mean, and they, and it's no big deal. I don't have to take a vacation day or anything like that. Um, but I didn't, I mean, business skills, I had, I've have, I'm looking at, you know, profit and losses and all this stuff. We have an administrator who does that. We have people we hire to do that for us. So it's not like we need to know everything about business, but I've learned a lot on the fly, but I don't think you need to have additional degree in order to, to be in a private practice. The main thing, the, the one thing that's important to know though, if you think about doing private practice, if you plan to do loan repayment, like income-based income driven or income based repayment or public service loan forgiveness, which I highly recommend. If you are in a private practice, you cannot, you don't know, you don't, you don't qualify for public service loan forgiveness because you're, you're for profit if you're in a private practice. So that's something to consider. If you know for sure you need to do public service loan forgiveness, then you want to be an employed physician with a hospital who that is not, that is nonprofit. Great, thank you for that advice. Um, people are saying that they didn't know that and we didn't know that either. So that's really great to know. There were some, a couple of questions asking about um, how involved you can be with community health efforts and like the surrounding community around you and um, like OB and GYN aspects. Yeah, I think it depends on the community you live in. It's certainly possible. I was, I had been on the board for um, a variety of, variety of nonprofits in my community for addiction um, treatment and like a norm, general community um, volunteer service. I uh, do community service for my church. I do a little bit less of it now because I have a business on the side that require, that I'm focusing on, um, but it's definitely possible. People, um, especially like college students, always want to know about birth control or going and speaking to, to schools about safe sex or a variety of things, or just teaching people about our bodies as women, just so that so few of us know about. There's a ton of opportunities depend on what your interests are that you can, and you'll definitely have time to get out there and, um, and serve if that's what you want. 
Great, thank you. And then kind of going off of that, there was another question asking um, what role you have in patient advocacy and um, like what relationship you have with your patients. Yeah, I think for my general, how I feel about my role as a phys physician is really more of an educator and a supporter. And I think that um, I really consider my patients to be my equals and my job is not to tell them what they should do or to feel like they're forced to do anything, but for me to educate them on all of the options, tell them what I would recommend based on my knowledge and experience and provide zero judgment for them to make their own decision. I'm very passionate about um, caring for women because women, we, as women, we are so hard on ourselves. And I have patients who come into me and literally have spent zero time all year on what they want what they um, should be focusing on, their own health, because they're constantly giving to their families, to their jobs, all this other stuff. And I think that I take that role very seriously to just be that there for that person and just provide a space for them to just like let it all out and just like tell me all the things that they're worried about and that they wish that they could you know, doing all their free time. And a lot of the times it's giving them permission to put themselves first because we don't, we don't tell that enough to anyone. And I, and I'll sit here and tell all of this, that same exact thing to you. You, you're, you are your number one asset. And if you don't put yourself first and your own desires and needs first, then you'll never be able to serve in the capacity that you want to serve as a physician. So get into the habit now of allowing yourself to care for yourself, to have hobbies that are interesting to you, even when you're in medical school, even when you're in residency, because that's what matters in the long run. Thank you so much for those words. There's so many things like the chat is blowing up right now, just saying how much they respect that and they appreciate it. They're hyping each other up. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think, um, you know, we always need to hear all of these positive thoughts. So we appreciate it. Um, that being said, a lot of people at the beginning, uh, when you mentioned your other business, mm -hmm. um, really wanted to talk about uh, work-life balance and imposter syndrome and all of that. So um, if you want to discuss that a little bit more, um, they're eating it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So work-life balance, I have, a, I have a few things to say about work-life balance. Um, that's not a real thing. Um, and I think that we do people a disservice by saying, oh, well, this work-life balance thing is, no, that's not true. Work-life balance looks like having boundaries. It looks like saying no. It looks like not being a perfectionist and it looks like putting yourself first. And if you do those four things, then you'll have work-life balance. But sometimes it means that I'm home late and I don't get to put my kids to bed because my patients need me more. And sometimes it means having to leave the office early because my kid got her arm dislocated at daycare. And it's like that. Some It's not 50-50. It's some days it's 100 percent one thing some days it's 75 25 and I think giving yourself permission for those kinds of ups and downs and um, sticking to like I said boundaries and self-love and not being a perfectionist those things are going to keep you whole and keep you balanced but to pretend that it's 50 50 is telling people the wrong message that's what I'll say about work-life balance what I'll say about imposter syndrome is that it is 100% part of the human condition. I used to think as a medical student, when I, I got my call to be a, to get into med med medical school, and I thought they called the wrong Kristen. I was like, they, they definitely called the wrong person. I'm going to um, wait for the call that they made a mistake, right? Same thing about residency. Same thing with this. When I ever got, I did well on a test. It was, that was a fluke. <laughs> that was luck, right? It was never because I knew what I was doing. That's imposter syndrome. And it's normal. I thought that I was the only one doubting myself, that I was the only one who didn't think I belonged in medical school or residency, and I was totally wrong. So um, I have a podcast that I interview, that I talk about imposter syndrome, and I interview other physicians who talk about imposter syndrome. And that's because everybody has it. And now that I'm talking about it more, um, 
I just, I wanted to shout it from the rooftops. Like um, imposter syndrome is part of the human condition. It's totally normal. And it's a complete lie. It's a complete lie. So when you're a little, that little voice in your head is telling you, you don't belong here. You're not good enough. Everyone here is smarter than you. It's total BS. So, and I know that to be true because I am completely over my imposter syndrome now, but that doesn't mean that I don't have thoughts sometimes that I'm not good enough. I totally do because I'm a human, but I don't let it hold me back from what I want out of life and my goals. I don't let it prevent me to be, I don't let it prevent me from being the best surgeon possible. I don't let it prevent me from giving the best care to my patients. And it totally was doing that when I was letting it and when I first graduated from residency. So that is what I can tell you about imposter syndrome. <laughs> so, I mean, any questions, I'll, that's my favorite thing to talk about, but I don't want to, I don't want to steal the chat about that. Um, I can promise you that you could keep going forever and we would eat it up, um, especially because uh, Lon and I still to this day, even though we've heard so many physicians talk about imposter syndrome, still are like, I don't know, it still feels like we're like, we have imposter syndrome about yeah. having imposter syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> so I think a lot of them feel like that too. And a lot of them are actually just now learning apparently what that even is um, yeah. and are diagnosing them. So, yeah. so yeah, if you want to keep talking about it, you are more than welcome to. <laughs> What well, everyone thinks that they're the special unicorn that really is an imposter. Like, no, it's really, I am actually the imposter. But what I'll tell you about that is that you're not doing yourself any favors and you can, we all have a choice, right? We all have a choice. We can choose to doubt ourselves. We can choose to believe that inner critic, that voice that's telling you you're not enough. Um, but you're holding yourself back. And I wish that I knew this as a medical student. I wish I knew this as a resident because I would be in such a better, I would have been in such a better place. I would have enjoyed it more. Like you're not your MCAT score. You're not your step score. You're not any GPA. You're not any of that. You're so much more than that. And your life experiences and all of your failures are everything that you need to be the best physician that you're gonna be. I would be nowhere near the physician that I am today without all the, all the stuff that I've done wrong. And I think when we can reframe it and say, look at all the things that I've done and I've grown from, that's when you really become like the best version of yourself and can relate to patients so much more. Like when I tell patients like, no, I have a real problem with chocolate. It's a real issue for me. Then I just feel like they can relate to me more because I'm just, I'm a human just like them. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, everyone's having, everyone loves it in the chat. They're having, they're throwing their own little life stories in there. Yeah. Your insights. That's really great. Thank you so much. Um, kind of, I guess, switching gears just a little bit. Yeah. People are asking a lot about research and in the aspect, like in undergrad and medical school, what research should you do if you want to pursue OB? And then also as a practice uh, OB attending, is there still the possibility to do research? Yeah, definitely. I think as an undergrad, oh my gosh, I'm so long ago now. So I was at my majors in undergrad were psychology and biomedical sciences because I thought I really love psychology. Um, so those are my, not even really related to medicine actually, but um, I didn't really do any research. I think I was in a lab briefly, but nothing crazy. Um, and then as a resident, I kind of was into research a little bit, but so I did, I, I, I published a poster that I submitted um, for a, for a um, conference just one time, but it depends on the program you go to. So if you go to a big um, like academic center that is very research oriented, you'll know that because you'll, they'll tell you that when you apply, then you'll, then you might want to have like more of a research brain. Every, I think every program now or most programs have a research requirement, but it's pretty, most of them are pretty easy to do. It's not like you have to be this intense four year pro, four years of research. It's usually just kind of like a literature review or something like that. Um, if you want to do research, then you should just go to an academic institution, become part of faculty and do research that way. So it definitely is super easy to stay in that world if, you, if, if, you, if it's an interest of yours. It's not particular interest of mine. So that's why I'm in private practice at a community hospital. 
And kind of going off of that, there were also questions about like private practice and academic settings. Um, how do you, what are, for you, like what are the major um, differences between and what made you choose private practice? And then what does academic setting look like for an OB? Yeah, so I, in OBGYN, academic versus community hospital has a lot to do with the kind of OB patients you see. So my hospital only has a level two NICU, which means that I don't deliver babies, unless it's an emergency, I don't deliver babies younger than 35 weeks. So anyone who were to come in with like premature rupture of membranes, we ship them to Boston to deliver there if they're, if they're before 35 weeks. Um, that's the main difference. Everything else is pretty much the same, except for that I don't have like, I don't have Gynoc at my hospital. I don't have REI at my hospital. All of those people have to go somewhere else. I'm about an hour from Boston. So we just send them to Boston. At an academic hospital, which is most of the, most of the places that you have a residency, it, the difference is that you deliver all ages of babies. So in residency, I delivered 23-week babies, 27-week. That was commonplace, all really high-risk OB patients. Um, and then we had all the specialties that, you know, in that same hospital system. Um, I chose community hospital because I didn't want to do the high-risk OB stuff. I liked the lower risk. I didn't want to deal with a lot of, like, P promers, triplets. I didn't want to do that. But if that's an interest of yours, then you'd want to stay at an academic hospital. Great. Thank you so much for clarifying that for us. And also, um, there's earlier when you were talking, just everyone felt inspired. And um, all the psychology majors were really excited to hear. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> to uh, Lana and I included. That's how we met. Oh, so. nice. So that's, the, that's the best major, I think. <laughs> We think so. <laughs> um, there were a ton of questions throughout. I'm just asking, like, was there a moment that you knew that you wanted to do OBGYN? Like, how was the specialty for you um, when you're choosing your specialty? Yeah. So I think that OBGYN kind of chose me. I know that's kind of lame to say, but in medical school, I was actually the president of the OBGYN interest group before I even, <laughs> even decided that I was going to be an OBGYN. So I think that there was part of me that was kind of tugging me in the direction of women's health. Um, and then when I realized for sure it was OBGYN, it was my first, like, um, in like my first rotation. I just knew it as a third year medical student. I liked other stuff. Like I liked surgery. I liked ortho. I liked, I liked pretty much everything except peds really. And, but OBGYN felt like home. It felt like home and I loved it and I didn't mind staying late. And I just knew that that was what I should be doing with my life. Um, I saw just briefly that someone asked about my interest in medicine. That's, um, I was later to the game. I thought for a long time that I was going to be a lawyer and then a judge actually until I was a freshman in college. And then I realized that I hated politics and law. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not going to be a lawyer then. So then I didn't know what to do. So but I always, but I love psychology. So then I became a psychology major. And then for a few years, I was like, well, I knew that I wanted to just keep going to school for the rest of my life. So I was like, oh, I'll get a PhD in psychology maybe. But then I didn't want to work with rats. And it, when you do a PhD in psychology, my thought was that I'd have to do research on a bunch of rats, which was not appealing to me at all. So then I said, oh, I'll just go to medical school. <laughs> and that's how that happened. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely relatable. Um, yeah. There was a question um, asking how you deal with loss um, in your specialty. I know it's different for every specialty, but this one kind of hurts a little more, um, especially like as a mother, does it hurt more or less? Loss, you mean like, like, like um, loss, loss like of like a child? And, yeah. yeah, this carriage or, you know. Yeah, that's the, the hard, yeah that's the hardest. It's one of the hardest things I do. I, um, it's a challenge and I think that, um, there's a thought that many physicians have that you can't like show your emotions to your patients or cry. And uh, I think I've broken that rule a few times, like for me to sit and just, you know, cry with a patient when their baby dies and um, it's devastating. And I think the hardest part is like 
allowing yourself to feel that for the patient and just be with her and know that like, I can't make it better. And there's so much that I don't have control over and neither does she. And for me, um, my number one job in those moments is to make sure that that patient knows that it's not her fault because as women, that's what we want to believe that we did something wrong to cause something, or we should have been doing something that we weren't doing. Um, so my job is to just be there with them and feel that loss with them so they don't feel alone, but then also to tell them that it's not their fault, but it's hard. It sucks. It really sucks. That's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, there was people asking as an OBGYN, do you feel that that specialty specifically allows you for more time to do activities outside of work, such as your little side business? Um, and then I guess like free specifically, but then also just the field in general, like the time to do things outside of work. Yeah, I think it depends on what you, what your schedule is. Anything is possible for sure. Um, I made the choice. I really, my nights are now made up of, I get home from work and I put my kids to bed and I either record a podcast or I'm interviewed for something or I'm speaking at an event um, or I'm working on my business. I'm coaching physicians, um, or doing something like that. So I make time for it because I love it, which just means that I don't watch TV anymore, which is strange to think about because I was someone who three years ago would watch like obsessed with the bachelor, like obsessed. It was a real problem. I had to break that habit. And I, I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes I really wish I could just watch the bachelor, but I know that it's a rabbit hole that I can't get you can't go down because I have, I have big goals and I love helping people. So that's more important to me. So I think that time you can have, you have time and we love to say we don't have time, but what you're really saying when you don't have time is that it's not a priority. And when you know your priorities, when your priorities are very clear, then it's easy to find time for things that you love. So I think as long as you pick a job that works for your life, again, you don't fit into a job, you find a job that fits you. As long as you follow that, num that number one rule, then you can find time for any hobby you want. And I have time for lots of hobbies. I read, I exercise every day. You go on vacation, I cook, I have lots of time. And I think that as long as you know what you want and who you're becoming, you can find time to do a whole slew of things. That's great, thank you so much. I love um, how you're saying don't, the like finding a career that fits in with your life, don't try to make you fit around. That's awesome, exactly. I really like that. Psychology majors unite once again, <laughs> all yeah. the great advice. Um, <laughs> someone asked, I, this is a question that like we don't really think about as students, but as a physician, how much time do you spend on documentation? Um, and like, do you ever have to bring it home and what that looks like? Yeah, I um, don't really get caught up in documentation, to be honest. I think that EMR, people complain about it. I just, you know, I think that you all will be totally fine. Like we've grown up typing now for years and I don't think it's an issue. I mean, yeah, is it annoying sometimes? I'm having to do 15 clicks for, to prescribe a medication, sure. But I don't, I don't, I don't get overly burdened by it. I really like doc, like electronic health record actually. Um, I don't bring my work home and that's a strict rule of mine. And um, just to give you some context, I'm, I'm the, probably the busiest physician in my practice and I'm the one who leaves earliest. And I'm, I leave with all my ultrasounds done, with all my notes done and all my tasks done. And that's because when I'm at work, I focus on work and sometimes I will, you know, get sucked in and check email and social media and talk to my friends and get a little bit behind. But for the most part, um, I do my work and I write my notes and I, um, spend time creating templates and doing things that are going to make EHR work for me. And those are things that are all going to come very naturally to you. So I don't feel overly burdened by, um, documentation. Great. That's awesome to hear. Um, some people are actually asking is 
if it's common to have scribes um, in private practice? Um, it's probably more common in employed practices only because scribes are expensive. One of my partners used a scribe briefly um, because she's a slow, she's slow at typing, but it's just expensive to, to have a scribe. So it's definitely an option for you, but I, I just can't, I can't imagine any of you guys with your background in technology needing that. Great, thank you for answering. Um, we had a question that um, is usually pretty hot topic whenever we uh, talk to OBGYNs, um, but as we know there's a uh, rise in um, Black mother mortality rates um, and pregnancies. Um, is there, um, you know, ways that you have learned to help combat the issue? Um, is that something you commonly see? A lot of people are just interested to hear your take on that. Yeah, this is a huge issue right now in my practice. And it's an interesting one because of where I am in the country. I'm in New Hampshire. Um, New Hampshire is a um, majority of people in this state and around me are Caucasian. So for example, all of the doctors and midwives and like all the providers in my practice are all white. And we have patients who are Indian, African-American, Asian, but they're not a lot. So we've been focusing on this problem because we know that there is racism in medicine and I'll give you a very specific example. There's something called a VBAC calculator, which is a vaginal birth after cesarean section calculator. And what it does is it calculates a woman's risk of um, having a successful vaginal delivery if they've had a prior C-section. And in someone who wants to have wants to try for a vaginal delivery and they had a C-section with their last baby, we can put values into a calculator and it tells us their likelihood of success. One of the questions is their race. And it's come to light now that that is totally a racist calculator. And our um, we are our hospital system is owned by Mass General. And they're doing some incredible research now with um, racism in medicine and how all of these things came to light. So that's something that um, we take very seriously because we recognize our um, implicit bias based on the fact that how we were raised as white women and that we were brought up in a medical system that's racist. And now, I th so I think even we're a little bit at a disservice because um, we need to be really careful about really questioning everything, especially when it comes to our minority patients about like, are we doing the right thing by them? Where is the, in, where is the bias, the, where is the bias here that we might be missing or we would over overlooking because we're all white. And so that's something that we've been focusing on. So it's, it's a, it's a huge topic. And I, I will say that like even among Facebook groups in the OBGYN world, um, it's a huge topic and we're all working on how to make it, um, how to make it better. Cause it's, it's, it, there's some work that needs to be done for sure. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about that. Um, that's really important. And someone actually mentioned that, it, um, it's black maternal, maternal health, week. Mother, health week. Yeah. So, um, that's super great timing for that question. Mm -hmm. Um, Another question kind of going off of that is how you confront health disparities and socioeconomic disparities in your um, patient population. Yeah, we're really lucky. Um, so as a private practice, we take people of all insurance, which is really nice because there are some private practices that don't do that for a cost perspective, but we've always chosen to do that. We also have in our community, a clinic that has um, a bunch of resources for um, like the population, especially with like an opioid use disorder, which is very common in where I live, very common. Um, so we take care of those women on the birth center, helping them to kind of get into medication assisted therapy with methadone or suboxone, providing resources and things like that. So that's how we get involved is more um, providing support more on the obstetric side than the GYN side, just based on where we are lo and lo located. 
That's great to hear. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, there was also throughout the session, there have been some questions on like um, midwives and doulas um, and they're kind of rising in popularity over the past several years yeah. and what your thoughts are on that and what, how your practice has changed now that um, there's more authority given to uh, like midwives and doulas. Yeah. So when I was in residency, um, I didn't work with midwives at all. So I didn't know what they really were, or what the difference was. In New Hampshire, midwife, midwifery care is very popular. So all of the practices in my town have midwives and, and there's different types of midwives. So my practice is certified nurse midwives. So they went to nursing school and then additional midwifery school, very well-educated women. That's, dip, that's, that's opposed to lay midwives, which is not a regulated thing. That's the scary stuff that you hear about um, people coming in and, you know, having their babies die and these horrible things. So I work with certified mid nurse midwives and they're incredible. I love working with them. Um, I had a midwife deliver my second baby and she was awesome. Um, they, they provide excellent care. And um, I say the same thing for doulas. I think that there's a wide spectrum of doulas. We work with several doulas that are incredible. They're a huge asset to our team. They help and support patients throughout pregnancy and the postpartum phase. And I think that if you can work in a place that the midwives and the doulas and the physicians feel like they're on the same team working with the patient and protecting her together, that's gold. And that's the practice that I have. Great, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, we did actually have a couple people ask um, if you could explain the difference between midwives and doulas. Yeah, so a midwife is someone who is gonna like care for you during pregnancy, like do things like listen to the baby's heart rate, um, they actually can physically deliver the baby, all that kind of stuff, C give you care, repair a laceration after delivery. A doula is like, um, providing support, meaning like they're helping you to change positions and they're pushing on your back when you're having a contraction and they're giving you different breathing techniques and they're, um, getting you ice chips and that kind of thing. That's the difference. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, I guess we can um, start wrapping up. Um, and we ask this question every time. Um, I'd like to get everyone's opinions. But um, as we are still um, in navigating through the pandemic, um, and as we talked about with you, we have lost a lot of opportunities that are hopefully going to be popping back up in the near future. Um, do you have any advice for us as uh, pre-med, post-bac, master's students um, navigating towards our journey to medicine? Yeah, I have a lot of advice. I'll, I'll try to sum it up. Um, you, if you want to be a physician, you will become a physician. And this pandemic has been a huge burden on you all. And you, all attending something like this with your interest and your um, and getting involved and creating things like this, like you ladies have done, is a perfect example of how committed you are to your field. So I think continue to think outside the box, continue to use social media and all of the things that you know about technology and connecting with other people despite the limitations we have, continue to use that to your advantage. You all, everyone here, is, are going to provide amazing care to patients. Don't ever let yourself, let your brain tell you that you don't belong. Because if you're sitting here listening to this on a Tuesday night, then you are in exactly the right place and you're on the right path. So think outside the box. Don't let the weird things that happen in this world hold you back. And most importantly, don't let your negative limiting beliefs about yourself hold you back either. Thank you so much, Dr. Yates. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, if you can open up the chat, you can just see like everyone, everyone's loving all the advice. And someone actually said they almost started crying. <laughs> um, so th thank you for that. We went ahead and um, put your Instagram and the podcast in the chat. Great. So people can definitely go check that out um, for more amazing advice. 
And we just yeah, there's somebody that talk. said that this was so zen. Your energy is so zen. It's exactly what we needed on a Tuesday. <laughs> oh, so we appreciate you being with us um, and taking time out of your night to speak with us. And uh, we hope you have a great week. Yeah, thank you so much. And anyone, reach out anytime. Send me a message if you any whatever you need. I'm here for you. So reach out anytime. Yes, we'll definitely be staying in touch, and we'll talk soon. Sounds great. Have a great night. You too. Bye. 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 Thank you. You're welcome.